Welcome back to True 911 Calls. In this video, a young man narrowly avoids being crushed to death in an industrial baler. There's a break-in at Pizza Hut. A hit and run destroys a family. And two parents seriously fail their daughter. On July 9th, 2010, John Maynard was 20 years old and a few months into his job at Smurfit Stone Recycling Company in Orlando, Florida. When the industrial cardboard baler he was operating jammed, Maynard sent his colleagues on their break and set about fixing it. But then, when he was inside the machine, he heard the engine start up. Knowing he was in an immediate danger of being crushed to death, he tried to jump out of the way, but his boot got caught. Uh, what was your emergency? I'm at Smurfit Stone, Orlando, which is on 7th Avenue. I just had my leg amputated by a baler. I need a 911 assistance immediately, please. You just had your leg amputated by a bailiff? Yes, ma'am. It is not a joke. I'm going to die. I'm going to believe you that I'm afraid. Okay. Where, where, okay. Are you, where are you again? Tell me where Smurfit you are. Smurfit Stone. Smurfit Stone. Smurfit Stone? Yes, ma'am. It's a recycling place on 7th Avenue. Seventh Avenue. And then OBG. Seventh Avenue. OBG. It's Seventh Avenue and Recycle Boulevard. Okay. Hold on. Hold on for the paramedics first. Ma'am, I'm going to die. Hold on. Please help me. Are you there by yourself, sir? No, sir, I'm not. But no one's hearing me. And I'm really losing blood, sir. I'm going to okay. die. Do you have anything that you can control the bleeding with, sir? Sir, I have nothing, sir. Okay. Is your leg, are you or your leg still stuck in the machine, sir? I am out. My leg is down in there. It was under, it was at my ankle, sir. Okay. Is it, is it above the knee, below the knee? Below the knee. It was at my ankle, sir. Okay. And uh, how old are you, sir? I'm 20, sir. 20. Yeah, um, we're we're is there people down. on the way? Yeah, they're on the way, sir, but do you, do you have anything at all you can use to control the bleeding, even if you have to take your shirt off? I have my jeans wrapped up around it, sir. Okay. You don't have a tight as a tourniquet. You just have, you're holding pressure to it, right? Right. Okay. We're coming as fast as we can. I'm going to stay on the phone with you, sir. Sir, I think I'm going to pass out. What is that number, sir? 407. Can you please okay. tell her I said I love her. I'm not going to die on her, but I love her anyways. Can you please tell her that? Yeah, we're coming, sir. You're not in. Every, everything's going to be all right. Okay. Everything's going to be okay, okay? We're around all the time. Yeah, so you're also on route. Yes. Okay, we're coming as, far, coming as fast as we can. I want you to control the bleeding, sir, with your one hand, okay? Yes, sir. I'm controlling it, sir. Okay. Where on the property is this machine located? When you come in, uh -huh. you're going to go straight. You're going to see a building, but you keep going. You're going to see a big blue baler. Uh -huh. Sir, I'm in the middle of that baler. I'm not moving. Okay. Sir, how much blood do I have to lose before I die? Um, I don't know, sir, but that's fine. Just just hold that shirt. Just continue to hold that shirt on there. Sir, I'm going to die. No, you're not, sir. My mother is going to I'm not, not going to die from this. My mother is going to kill me. Okay. We're, we're coming, sir. We're coming. Sir? Yeah, I'm here, sir. What is what is your name? My name's Chef, sir. I love you, dude. Okay, we're coming you as fast as we can. Sir, uh, just, we're coming as fast as we can. Just keep talking to me and use your other hand. Control that bleeding, okay? Uh, can, you please, can you please play with me? Can you please play with me? Okay, go ahead, sir. I love you, this Lord. I bring you all my sins I've ever committed, Lord. And I love you so much. Please don't let me die, but if I do die, Lord, please let me go to the good place. I know I've done so much shit in my life, Lord. I've done so much. But Lord, please just let me be okay. And if I'm not okay, let me live in heaven with you. Please do my mother. Keep her strong because I know she's not going to be happy. God, please let me get through this. Sir, I don't hear an ambulance or anything. They're, they're coming as fast as they can, sir. Please don't let me you, die. Well, you're not going to die, sir. How are you doing with your uh, with the control and the bleeding? It's pretty much stopped. But I don't okay. know how much longer I can keep my hand okay. up, sir. Well, what, well, that's fine. I understand because you're probably feeling faint, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, uh, that's why I want you to continue to talk to me. Okay? That'll Are take your mind off. now? The... They're coming. To... They're just around the corner from you. Sir? Yes, sir. I forgot about my dad. That was my dad. My stepdad, he adopted me. Mm -hmm. Please tell him I love him, too. Yes, sir. What is your name? My name is John. John, 
pretty gruesome in here, I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, no, I understand, I understand. There's, the police are there now looking for you, okay? Sir, I'm going to pass out. Okay, no, I want you to keep talking to me. You're going to be fine. Hello? They're coming, Hello? John. John, they're coming. John. Yeah. When the first responding officer got to the recycling plant, he saw Maynard's colleagues, Richie and Dave, eating sandwiches and smoking. Nothing looked out of the ordinary, so thinking the report must have been a prank, the officer turned and left. But for some reason, he went back to two men and asked them if someone named John worked there. When Richie replied that someone named John worked there and was working the bailer, the officer told Richie to get into his car and direct him there. Your co-worker just found you, right? Yeah, he just found me. Okay. Tell you, is he still there with you? No, he wants to get the police. Okay. Okay, sir. Yeah, that's I fine. Love, I love everybody. Okay, they're coming. I'm on the phone. Yes, sir. Okay, sir, he's telling me I can hang up with you now. You're going to hang up with me? Okay. Yeah, he's All right. telling me. All right. We're gonna, we can disconnect now, sir. All right, John, they're gonna take they're gonna take good care of you, okay? Can you Yeah, I will take care of calling your mother. I'm gonna write you a letter and send you flowers. Okay. John, I'm gonna i I'm gonna take care to call take call your mother, okay? Sir, actually yeah. it might be smarter to call my dad because my mom will probably pass out. Okay, what is your mother your dad's phone number? Okay, so I'm gonna hang up with you, sorry. Can you call my mom? Sorry, I gotta go. Okay, that's fine. The person heard in the background was Richie. Maynard said that his face turned as white as a ghost when his colleague saw him. The 20-year-old was lifted out of the machine and rushed to Orlando Regional Medical Center. His severed foot was retrieved from the bailer, put on ice, and rushed to the hospital after him and another ambulance. The man lost consciousness in the ambulance but survived. Unfortunately, his foot couldn't be reattached and Maynard's right leg had to be amputated six inches below his knee. It turned out that the worker was doing exactly what he had been taught to do in the event of a blockage in the bailer. It was his employer who was at fault. In a video titled, How I Lost My Leg, Bailer Accident, Maynard explains that it had been raining and the wet cardboard had gotten jammed in the bailer. I thought the weight differential from a normal load to this load was because of the water. So, um, I started running the machine really slow so as to not jam it, but first of all, it's really easy to jam when the cardboard's wet in the first place because it comes all, it becomes almost like a paper mache material, um, like, a, like a sludge, um, but also now I have the thicker cardboard. It was not long before the machine jammed, and I knew right off the bat this was going to be a bad jam, it was going to take me forever to fix, and um, part of my job was to fix jams. So I go ahead and I open it up and I look inside and I assess the situation and I know this isn't gonna be a quick fix. So um, I shut the whole machine down, I lock it out, I tag it out, I, I bleed the line, I have it completely closed off. Richie comes around on the forklift, he's like, is everything good? And I tell him, I jammed the machine, I gotta fix it. And I say, how about you and Jeff go on break? Cause we were due for a break soon anyways. I said, you guys go on break. There's no point in you standing around for probably 20, 30 minutes while I do this. And then we go on break. You might as well just go on break now. And um, I'll, just, I'll just work through my break, fix the jam, and we'll get back up and running in about 30 minutes. Maynard jumped down into the bailer and started the tedious process of trying to unblock the jam. He finally found the bit of the card causing the blockage, but then he heard the machine come back on. And so I knew I had, I had no time to, to, to falter or think, to be like, oh my gosh, I had to get up. So I jumped up on top of the ram and um, jumped for the entry door. And um, I, I made it to the door and I was pulling myself up and out of the way and I was gonna let the ram go underneath me and then drop down on it, kind of restabilize myself and then go back through the door properly. Um, but it caught the sole of my work boot and pulled my foot down, pulled it under and then snapped my ankle off right there. It snapped it at the shin above the ankle. And like in a matter of seconds, I watched as my foot just kind of disappeared out of sight under the blades and then boom, it was snapped off. And um, it happened really fast. I almost didn't have a second to process it. And then I realized like, holy shit, my foot is gone. In a cruel twist of irony, Maynard's foot then pushed the last bit of blocked card through the machine, which had enabled it to continue its cycle. He managed to jump up to the entry window, pull himself into the control room and hit the emergency stop button. 
I grabbed the walkie-talkie and I yelled onto the walkie-talkie, I just had my leg cut off, somebody call 911. I tossed the walkie-talkie onto the desk and then I sat down. Completely, um, all of my energy gone, I was, I was done, I had nothing left in the tank. Then the lady on the walkie-talkie, because my two guys didn't bring their walkie-talkies or turned them off, we're not sure, they did not hear my call. But some lady at an entirely different company heard my call. If you listen to the 911 call, you can hear somebody in the background, that's her yelling at me through the actual CB radio, basically. It was like a giant walkie-talkie receiver and then we had like a handheld thing like truckers would use. She's yelling at me, that's not a funny joke, this is for a professional line only, you do not call and say that you have that you have an accident, you don't call for 911, um, go get your parents, blah blah blah. Basically she thought I was a kid playing around. Then Maynard remembered his cell phone was on the desk. He grabbed it and called 911. The woman who had heard him on the CB radio called 911 about 20 minutes later, but thankfully, help was already on the way. Maynard was drug tested at the hospital as part of the investigation into the accident. His results came back clear and his employer was found to be at fault. There was so many different things that they, they didn't do properly and um, they got fined one of the largest fines OSHA had ever levied against the company up to that date. And they actually had to file bankruptcy because they, they, they were found so heavily to be at fault. I was not at fault. The 911 dispatcher was awarded for how he handled the call. And John Maynard remains friends with Chris, the first responding officer, until this day. Following the accident, Maynard learned to walk using a prosthetic. He now uses his YouTube channel Crew 9T to help other amputees come to terms with their injuries. The young man wrote, My accident has changed my outlook toward the world, and I feel that my goals and even my way of thinking have changed too. Hit like and subscribe so you don't miss the next selection of unbelievable true 911 calls. In the early hours of March 21st, 2018, a man claiming to be Jesus Christ broke into a Pizza Hut in North Carolina. He helped himself to a pizza and bottle of Mountain Dew and then dialed 911 to report his crimes. While it first sounded like the caller was under the effects of drugs or alcohol, he was actually in the middle of a psychotic episode due to his schizophrenia. I point 911, what is your emergency? Yes, this is Jesus Christ, and I just broke into the Pizza Hut. I broke the window, and I'm here. Jesus is here now. He's back. He's back to Earth. All right. And uh, you don't work there? No, I just broke in, had a pizza. I'm Jesus. And what was your name again? My name is Jesus. What's your last name, Jesus? Christ. Okay. And what do you look like? I look like Jesus. What else do I supposed to look like? Why, why'd you do that? Because I'm Jesus. I can do whatever I want. We're okay. tired of Judas's on this earth. We're going to clean this earth up. So what are you up to? Man, well, where do you live at? I don't. I'm from heaven. How'd you get over, over to the Pizza Hut? I'm from heaven, sir. Okay. And did, would you break a front window? Yeah, I broke the door window, sir. And did you eat a pizza? Yeah, had a Mountain Dew. All uh, right, you going to stay there for a minute? Yeah. Uh, you ain't got any weapons or anything on you, do you? No, I'm not violent, sir. Okay. Just hungry? Yeah, I'm starving to death. All right. Everybody's been treating me. I've been beat up in this town. I'm from Indiana. <clears throat> You're from Indiana? Yes. Okay. People keep beating me up. Where have you been staying at? Everywhere. I keep getting kicked out of places. Mm-hmm. I got schizophrenia, sir. Yeah, nobody else is there with you? Uh uh When authorities arrived at the restaurant in the city of High Point, they arrested 46-year-old Richard Quinter without incident. Quinter was taken to Guildford County Jail and charged with felony breaking and entering and felony larceny. The mentally ill man was assigned a public defender and remained in custody on a $1,000 bond. While waiting to appear in court regarding the break-in, the recording of his 911 call went viral. Many news outlets picked up the story, but most of them reported it for comedic entertainment 
and cut the audio before Quinter told the dispatcher, I got schizophrenia, sir. While people as far away as Canada and the UK laughed at his delusion, Quinter's mother, Alice Yorks, was crushed. She spoke to WFMY News too. It was the most heart-wrenching thing to turn on a radio and hear my son's voice being used as a soundbite for entertainment. Her son was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia at age 19 when he was found walking unclothed in public and hearing voices. With the support of his family and antipsychotic medication, Quinter managed his condition and lived well for several years. He worked and got married, but things took a downward turn in 2011. Quinter's marriage broke down and his schizophrenia took hold. His mom said that because of his paranoid schizophrenia, he would think there were people behind the walls and he tore down the walls. This resulted in Quinter being homeless and led to him using street drugs. He bounced between assisted living facilities, group homes, and boarding houses, but he couldn't escape the voices in his head. Quinter was soon seriously unwell. Symptoms are more severe during an acute schizophrenic episode like the one Quinter was experiencing when he broke into Pizza Hut. His mom said that he jumped out of a two-story apartment window during one such episode after seeing hallucinations of people trying to bury his mother in concrete. Quinter became a ward of the state and was appointed a guardian representative and a treatment team. While in jail, Quinter's family reported that he wasn't mentally evaluated and that because his mother wasn't his legal guardian, she wasn't able to see him. Without medication, Quinter's delusions continued, which led to him being put in segregation due to his bizarre behavior. Quinter's guardian rep visited him about three weeks after his arrest but prison staff told them that the accused had been moved to the ER because of a minor incident. Later, his family found out that he had bitten off a large part of his tongue. Quinter had been taken to High Point Regional Hospital by this time, and his mother was allowed a 30-minute visit. Before the visit, she told WFMY News 2. I'm a little afraid. I don't know what I'm going to see or what I'm going to encounter, but I do get to see. 47 days after his arrest, Quinter was finally given a psychiatric evaluation and was moved to Central Regional Psychiatric Hospital in Butner on an involuntary commitment order. It took 50 days to get him to a treatment facility where he could really be helped. The charges against him were dropped and he began therapy to help him relearn to eat and speak with his damaged tongue. His family started a Facebook page to raise awareness of the treatment of mentally ill people while in police custody and to tell the truth behind the story of Pizza Hut Jesus, which had become a joke to many. Quinter received cards of support and, in September, was well enough to be moved to the long-term care unit. From here, he recorded a birthday message for his mom. Happy birthday, Nana! Seneca and Gus and I love you with all our heart. You've been there with us. Thank you for all the wonderful pictures. You have an awesome birthday. I'm crazy about you, Mama. You've been there through thick and thin, and I hope I can reward you someday. Have an awesome birthday! Yeah! After Thanksgiving in 2018, his mom posted on Facebook saying, we got to spend nearly two wonderful hours with him this afternoon. We shared lunch, played some cards. He told his awful jokes. Bean lectured him on drinking too much Mountain Dew and gave lots and lots and lots of hugs. Quinter was discharged in February 2019 into an adult care home where he continued to do well. He calls it out there. I know it's scary to him too, but yet he wants his freedom. But mental illness is unpredictable, and due to a change of medication following a medical issue, Quinter deteriorated and was eventually asked to leave the group home. Quinter's family continues to fight for changes in the treatment of mentally ill within the U.S. criminal justice system, and told WMFY. But behind that smile is a worried mind. It's just not my story. It's just not Richard's story. It's the story of the mentally ill.
a father was left dead and his fiance in the hospital after a hit and run on the Baltimore Washington Parkway in Maryland. It was around 9.15 p.m. on February 1st, 2015, and the couple had just finished changing a tire on their vehicle when they were struck by a speeding car. Thankfully, their two teenage children, who were with them at the time, were unharmed. But when the man's 13-year-old daughter called 911 to report the incident, the dispatcher did little to alleviate the child's distress. Hello. All right, this is transferred in. Yeah, Route 295. I don't know where. 295 and where? I'm not sure where. Ma'am, stop yelling. I need an, a location. Okay, 295. That's good. We're, we're located now on a highway. Now, that's a pretty long road. We're on the side of the highway. We're the only car pulled over. Okay, what's going on? Somebody hit them and they just kept going. Yeah, they both are laying on the ground. We need y'all help now. Okay, a person struck by a vehicle? Yes, yes. Okay, so a car was driving down the road and struck two people? Yes, they did. They didn't stop. They just kept going. Okay, and are they breathing? Yes, I think so. Can y'all hurry up, please? Ma'am, l listen, let's stop worrying about hurrying up and get there. We're already on our way. I need to find a better location. Yes, I don't know. That's all I can say. Jules, we're on 295, all right? Yes, we're on 295. We're over the side of the... Huh? I'm sorry? Yeah, GPS where we are. I, I don't need the GPS. I just I was just finding out some information. Yes, we just pulled over. We just we the only car pulled over on the road. Okay, we're already in route. Are these people breathing? Yes, they are. What is your name? Johnny Williams. All right, are they conscious right now? Yes, one of them, one of them. No. One of them is yes. conscious. So two people were struck? Yes, they both whined. They just whined. Okay, let's here. stop whining, okay? Let's stop whining. It's hard to understand you. Two people were struck, correct? Yes, yes. And they are breathing? Yeah. yeah. Okay, what kind of injuries do they have? I'm not sure one, the one that's talking on her hip. I don't know, my father's not saying anything. So they're awake? Yeah, yeah. No, only one of them. Uh, only one. Okay. One's awake, one's not awake. Yeah, right now, yes. Okay. Are they both breathing? Huh? huh? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, okay. they're all, yeah, for right now, yes. Okay. Are they out in the middle of the road or are they on the no, side of the road? Right now, when they hit, when they hit them, they yeah, both move yeah. to the side. Okay. Can you walk up to these people and kind of find out some information for me? Yeah, I was, I saw right here. I was right here the whole time. What do you need to know? Okay. I don't need to know what exactly happened. I need to find, ma'am, I need you to walk up to these people and I need you to look and tell me what's going on with these people. One of them, they just laying on each other. My father's laying on her and they just laying here. I can't they're just laying here. Is there someone else there I can talk to because it's so hard? It's only my little brother. I'm talking better than him right now. Okay. Well, one person is conscious, correct? Yes, yes. And one person is unconscious. Yes, I already on that way. He just wants Okay, ma'am, ma'am, please stop yelling. Stop yelling, please. Let's stop yelling. You said somebody is laying on top of them? Not all the way on top, but he's leaning on her. Okay, why? Uh, I don't know. That's how you feel if she can't move because she, her hip is her hip. So who's laying on top of the woman? So my father. Why is he laying on top of her? Uh, he's not laying on top of her. He's just leaning on her. Why is he leaning on her? He can't move. He's unconscious. He's, I don't know what. I don't know. Okay, so the people that... <laughs> Ma'am. Ma'am. Yes? The, the person that's laying on top or leaning up against her was part of the person that was hit. Yes, it was both. Both of them got hit. Both of them. Okay. Police, go ahead with your questions. Ma'am, did you see what kind of vehicle struck? Them? No, I didn't see. It's dark out here. I was sitting in the car. They were outside. I just heard it. He did not stop. Slow down. And he said, Ma'am, stop yelling. Ma'am, stop yelling. Please. 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 Ma'am, st
also called to report the incident. This dispatcher sent units to the scene while the original dispatcher was still talking to the 13-year-old and was yet to send help. In the 20 minutes between the couple being hit and help arriving, not a single vehicle stopped to help. Warwick had pulled over to change the tire on the parkway just north of Route 197, about 20 miles from Baltimore. His hazard lights were on, and his children were holding flashlights. Warwick had just finished changing the tire when the vehicle smashed into him and pierced and sped away. Other than the children, there were no witnesses. 38-year-old Rick Warwick and his fiancée, 28-year-old Julia Pierce, were rushed to the hospital. But the father of five had sustained fatal injuries and died that Sunday night. His fiancée had a broken femur but survived. The biological mother of Warwick's children had already passed away, so the teams became orphans after he died. Police collected debris from the scene, including fragments of the vehicle that had fled the collision. However, as the weeks turned into months, the police had turned up nothing. Then, three months after leaving the fatal accident scene, a 73-year-old man named Earl Teeter turned himself in. Police seized the vehicle he had been driving, a 2004 Toyota Sienna from Brown's Honda repair shop in a suburb of Baltimore and charged him with leaving the scene of an accident and operating a vehicle without due care. Both charges carry a maximum sentence of six months, and Teeter pleaded guilty to both crimes. But when he was sentenced on September 30th, he was spared jail and given 24 months probation for each charge in community service. He was allowed to keep his driving license with the restriction of only being allowed to drive during certain hours. The judge said that Teeter's light sentence was due to the incident happening on a parkway. Teeter being a Vietnam War vet and having no prior driving convictions. After being sentenced, Teeter left the court without making a statement. Pierce was heartbroken and told WUSA 9, I understand that he was older and that it wasn't going to be much, but I really just needed him to say he was sorry. And he wasn't sorry, she told CBS Baltimore. We're human beings, not roadkill. That's what it makes me feel like, roadkill. Warwick's mother, Charmaine Farrell Anthony, told the same outlet, it was just a sad day, a sad day. The justice wasn't served fair. When the 911 call was released, the public was outraged Captain Davies, who spoke on behalf of the department that had taken the call, admitted to the LA Times that the call didn't meet their expectations or follow the training they had been given. He said, The dispatcher has been placed in a job where he has no public contact until we complete the process of the investigation. Captain Davies from Arundel Fire Department told the press, That's not how the public expects to be treated when calling 911 in an emergency like that but also stated that, while the call did not meet our expectations, we do not believe it affected dispatch time. But Victor Stone, an attorney for the Maryland Crime Victims Resource Center, disagrees. The Chicago Tribune reported him saying, if Teeter had actually called 911, even if it had meant them getting there a handful of minutes earlier, I think there's a chance they could have saved Warwick's life. An attorney who argued for Teeter to get jail time told the court that if the hit and run had happened on any other road in Maryland, he would have faced up to five years per charge in jail. Earl Teeter died almost six years later, in December 2020, at the age of 78. As for the 911 dispatcher who told Warwick's daughter to stop whining, he no longer works for the fire department and won't be taking any more 911 calls. On March 11, 2018, a man in Ohio called 911 and asked for an ambulance for his four-year-old daughter. What do you need an ambulance for, sir? Yes, hi, my, uh, my daughter is having a hard time breathing. She's breathing, but she's young. She's barely breathing. Is she able she to talk in complete sentences? No, she can't. She's not talking in no complete sentences at all. How old is she? Four. She had fell out, and we were just trying to see what's going on with her. Is she conscious now? Is she conscious? Yes. But 
but she's not really breathing. She's not speaking. She's not speaking. She's not responding to us. Is she awake? Her eyes are open. Her eyes are open, yes. But she's not really alert? She's not saying anything or responding to our... When I press down on her chest, she'll make a sound. Okay. Well, don't press down on her chest, okay? No, with two hands. Uh -uh. Does your daughter have a history? Does she have a history of what? Yeah, does she have a history of any breathing issues? No. What was she doing before this happened? Well, she's been acting a little sick. We, we went to Red Lobster last week. I thought it was because of that because she started acting weird. I thought it was like a, a stomach virus or something of what she ate or whatever. And I noticed as she's been at home, we started like feeding her and she was just throwing everything up. So gave her ginger ale, she threw the ginger ale up. I gave her, I gave her Tylenol, she spit that up. Okay. When's the last time she ate or drank anything? Um, we try to give her um, some breakfast in the morning and she ate like a little bit of it but it's like she kept chewing and she was prolonged to chewing it for a long time. She's been having these flu these flu like symptoms for how long? It started last Thursday when we came for her a lot so we know that she started acting weird. Since last Thursday? Yes. As in like a few days ago? Yes. Has she been running a fever? Um, she was a little hot but then her body would like just be weird to turn cold. What is your name? Anaya, A-N-I-Y-A. -A. What's your last name? Day, D-A-Y. Did you guys try contacting the child's pediatrician? Did we try? Yeah, did you call her pediatrician when this started? No, I actually just spoke to a 24-hour nurse. Okay. What is she doing now? Well, now I just got her sitting up. I tried to even um, put them on, um, do mouth to mouth. Well, if she's breathing, you probably don't need to do CPR. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I like I put my fingers, I put my, I'm just trying to, I'm just, I don't know, I'm just trying to figure out what else can I do. Like I put my hands up to her nose to see if she was breathing and I didn't feel no air coming out. Like she got her eye open. Wait a minute, is she not breathing? No. Your child is not breathing? No. Okay, let's do CPR then. That's what I'm trying to do. I, I, I didn't do my whole force two hands. I just two, two hands, two fingers, two fingers basically is what I'm doing. Okay, I want you to get her on a flat surface, okay? Okay, say it again. All right, place your daughter flat on her back on the floor, okay? Okay. okay. Kneel down near her chest. She is definitely not breathing, correct? Yes. Okay. Place the heel of your hand in the center of her chest. Mm -hmm. Put your other hand on top of the first hand. I want you to push right. down firmly on the chest at least two inches, only to the heel of your hand. Okay. okay? We're going to do it 30 mm -hmm. times, just like you're pumping her chest, okay? You're going to count out loud with me. Are you ready? Okay. Keep going, okay? The squad just called that they're unseen. We have, I need some, one of you guys to get up and go open the door. Okay? Get her down there now. Is she still not breathing? Yeah, she makes a sound whenever we do that. Whenever we, you know, we do the little pumping thing, she made a sound like a, hmm, 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 hmm. But then Is she, she breathing? Stopped. Check her nose. Somebody should still be pumping. You feel cold air. You feel cold air. feel cold air coming out the nose. There's cold air coming out of the nose? Yes. Okay, if she's got air coming out. Is her chest rising up and down? No. Her chest is not. All right, keep pumping. Okay, if her chest isn't going up and down, I want you to keep going until the squad gets there to take over. All right, the, the, the paramedics are here now. All right, all right, problem. let them take over, okay? All right. All right, thank okay. you. Responding fire department paramedics arrived at Cultural Garden Apartments in Euclid, Cleveland, just before 11.30 a.m., they found the little girl lying underneath an air conditioning unit inside the apartment. She was lifeless and unresponsive with a noticeable black eye. The child's skin was pale, and no cardiac activity could be detected. Four-year-old Anaya Day Garrett was taken to a nearby hospital where she was pronounced dead.
Although he identified himself as her father, the man who dialed 911 was 26-year-old Deontay Lewis, the boyfriend of Anaya's 23-year-old mother, Sierra Day. Day once again mentioned their visit to Red Lobster a few days before and told authorities that Anaya had been weak, sick, and not eating since that visit. However, it was immediately obvious to those who saw her body that the child had been suffering for a long time. Her small body was malnourished and covered in burns, cuts, and bruises. Some new and some old. Paramedics later testified that she was so emaciated to the point that she was just skin and bones. Investigating detective Phil Shetter noticed a number of household cleaners on a counter inside the apartment and a strong smell of bleach. This and other evidence was taken from the home, and Anaya's death was quickly ruled a homicide. Euclid police arrested the mother and her boyfriend on suspicion of murdering the four-year-old. They were both later indicted on charges of aggravated murder and taken into custody on a $1 million bond. Day told investigating officers that she heard a loud boom come from the bathroom and that when she went to see what had caused it, she said she saw her daughter lying on the floor. She said Anaya had then gotten up and tried to walk but stumbled and fell. A woman who lived in the same apartment complex posted online saying that some neighbors had called the police to the family's apartment due to domestic disturbances. She claimed that the child's belongings were discarded next to the dumpsters when the apartment was cleaned out. She noted that the clothes looked barely worn, and her toys were expensive but looked as if they hadn't been used. The neighbor wrote, She had everything she needed except love inside that home. It broke my spirit for a very long time, and our community is still healing. Cuyahoga County Children and Family Services had investigated three reports about Anaya's well-being in 2017. Still, the agency claimed they found no reason at the time to remove the child from the home. When the medical examiner performed an autopsy, he saw a subdural hematoma, bleeding between the brain and skull and a telltale sign of a sudden impact to the head. The doctor concluded that Anaya had suffered blunt trauma to her head resulting in a stroke and her premature death. Day and Lewis were tried jointly. The mother's defense attorney argued that she hadn't purposefully or intentionally killed her daughter and highlighted the fact that Day's IQ is in the bottom three percentile and she suffers cognitive and learning difficulties. Is there a sinister motive in the things that she said and did? Day's defense asked the court, is there a sinister motive in how she acted and responded? Or is she just a young lady that operates in the bottom 3% of our population? Is she a young lady with such cognitive difficulties that she doesn't understand some of those things? Lewis's defense attorney attempted to place the blame solely on the child's mother. In her closing argument, she stated, He didn't want this child to die. That's why when he found her unresponsive, he called 911. He wanted to save her life. The prosecution called several witnesses to back up their argument that both defendants had abused Anaya and were responsible for her death. Day's sister testified that she had observed changes in her niece's appearance and behavior, and that things worsened when her sister began her relationship with Lewis. She didn't really seem like a child. She was very standoffish, she really didn't. seem happy. After a while, she said, her niece's physical determination became more noticeable. She was getting smaller. I thought maybe that just had something to do with her getting taller. You know, when you grow, toddlers grow, they slim out a little bit. Um, she was getting littler and littler uh, to the point you can see the extension of her stomach sticking out, so to speak. Toward the end of 2017, the sisters fell out and Day blocked her sister on social media. Concerned that her niece was being abused, she informed family services and contacted Anaya's biological father, Mikhail Garrett. I told Michael that I felt like 
and Naya was being abused. Something wasn't right, that they were hiding her. She wasn't coming around a lot and that we needed to do something to stop this. I told Family Service the same thing, that something was wrong with my sister. Something was going on with her. She needed help and that they needed to get my niece out of that household. Anaya's father also took the stand. He said he had also reported the abuse to Cuyahoga County Children and Family Services and had been in the process of trying to get sole custody of his daughter. And protect our children and speak out, be that voice, and make sure it's heard for the fathers out there that are still fighting to be in their children's lives. Just always ensure that children's lives are always protected. And those are, uh, who, who, who fail children's lives are always held accountable as well. Anaya attended two daycare centers. A member of staff from Harbor Press Daycare Academy testified at trial. So I let her sit on my lap. And then I said, does that hurt? And she said, yeah. She said, mommy did it, but mommy said I failed. One day, the little girl was dropped off at daycare with a black eye. Sweetie, did you fall off the slide, off the swing? Like, what happened? And she said, Mommy, push me. And I said, outside? And she said, down some steps. Mommy, push me. When the daycare worker asked Day about this, the mother said her daughter was lying. On another occasion, a staff member noticed Anaya had facial injuries and dried blood in her ear. The worker demanded the daycare center call 911 and threatened to quit if nothing was done. The detective who had noticed the bottles of cleaner and also testified. He spoke of the apartment being very clean and mentioned finding wet towels in the bathroom. Police believed that Day and Lewis had cleaned up after Anaya was harmed and before they called 911. When called as a witness, a nurse told the jury, my observations were the little girl was skin and bones. Her eyes were wide open, her mouth was open, the nurse said Anaya was bruised, fragile, stiff, and cold. Deputy Medical Examiner Joseph Fellows' testimony was harrowing. He described the suffering the four-year-old had endured at the hands of her abusers. When I did the, the external examination, um, I'm looking for any signs of injuries or illnesses. And certainly the major illness that I see is malnourishment, as I stated those findings there. Um, her skin is, is very loose, and that's because she's lost the uh, muscles and fat that make our skin more plump. Um, and I can see her underlying bones. Um, looking for signs of injuries, she essentially has um, a very prominent black eye. She's got a bruise around her, her left eye, um, and it's a, a very prominent purple color with a laceration, which is a, a tear um, caused by blunt trauma of her left upper eyelid. Um, she also has a bruise on the uh, right side of her, of her forehead. And then she has some scattered um, abrasions um, on her left arm and, and as well as her back. Um, there's also some areas where her skin has sloughed off. They were uh, blisters at one time, and those are collected on her um, uh, lower legs on both the, the right and left lower legs and her feet. Um, I documented everything externally. The internal examination revealed further signs of the abuse Anaya had suffered. Internally, she has um, consistent with a loss of soft tissue, so she doesn't have much fat. Her muscles have somewhat wasted away. Um, I noticed that she has um, some, some signs of shock. Um, shock being she's got hemorrhages of her skin around her right eye. Those are called petechial hemorrhages. It's as the body is slowly dying, um, it, which is shock, um, she gets small hemorrhages. There's also some um, uh, collapsing of her lungs, meaning she's not taking deep breaths, and so the lungs are collapsing. And she's also developed some um, uh, pancreatitis, which is inflammation of the pancreas because she's not eating as, as she should be. Her pancreas is starting to digest itself because it secretes enzymes, which are pro, um, chemicals to break down food. Um, she also has developed some um, ulcers of her stomach 
um, also because of shock uh, for lack of food. Um, th those were all in, in her torso. I didn't see any, any signs of infection, any signs of broken bones, um, any other reason for her malnourishment. Um, but on the inside of her head, um, she has um, evidence of, of uh, previous injuries. She's got the bruises I stated on the right side of her forehead. Um, there's no injuries to the underlying skull. Um, but on the surface of her brain, she has what's known as, she's got a, a healing blood clot. The medical term is a subdural hematoma, which is blood that has collected on the surface of the brain, but below the dura, which is a thin membrane that goes around the entire skull and spinal cord, a spinal canal. Because of that hematoma or blood clot, it had pressed on the surface of the brain to cause her left side of her brain to have a stroke. Um, so the, a stroke is dead brain tissue. Um, and all of that had happened weeks to months prior to her death. Um, he said she didn't receive the injury and die. The impact to her head had happened 10 days to two weeks prior. And that time, the girl's lungs had been collapsing and she had developed pancreatitis and stomach ulcers from the lack of blood. At just over three feet tall, Anaya weighed just 26 pounds and had a BMI of 11. After five days of testimony, the protection closed their case saying, ladies and gentlemen, Sierra Day failed miserably in the care of her only child. Deontay Lewis failed miserably as her stepfather, her father, her whatever title he gave himself, and he failed as a human being. After deliberating for just under a day, the jury returned their verdict. On count one, aggravated murder. We, the jury in this case, being duly and panel sworn, do find the defendant, Sierra Day, guilty of aggravated murder in violation of Revised Code 2903.01c of the Ohio Revised Code as charged in count one of the indictment, signed by all 12 jurors. Likewise, count two, murder. Uh, guilty, signed by all 12 jurors. A further finding with respect to count two is guilty of felonious assault, uh, permitting child abuse, endangering children as to the uh, offense of violence under the murder B of count two, signed by all 12 jurors. Count three, guilty of felonious assault, signed by all 12 jurors. Count five, endangering children. Guilty, signed by all 12 jurors, further finding that the defendant did cause serious physical harm to an eye a day, signed by all 12 jurors. Count six, endangering children, guilty, signed by all 12 jurors, further finding the defendant did cause serious physical harm to an eye a day, signed by all 12 jurors. Count eight, tampering with evidence, guilty, signed by all 12 jurors, I'm sorry, count seven as well, guilty of endangering children, <coughs> signed by all 12 jurors. The further finding with respect to count seven, the defendant did cause serious physical harm to an IA day. With respect to uh, defendant Lewis count one, we the jury in this case being duly on panel sworn to find the defendant Deontay Lewis guilty of aggravated murder in violation of 2903.01c of the Ohio Revised Code. Count two, murder B. Defendant is guilty, signed by all 12 jurors. With respect to the further finding of the offense of violence, he was guilty of a felonious assault, signed by all 12 jurors. The further finding of permitting child abuse was guilty, signed by all 12 jurors. Uh, and uh, endangering children, is guilty signed by all 12 jurors. Day and Lewis were both sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Following the verdict, Paul Grieco, Anaya's birth father's attorney, told the press that the verdict was just the first step in responsibility and accountability for Anaya's death and said, the system failed Anaya and the Garrett family and the system will be held accountable. The changes that they're making, they talk about it but we don't see any action being made behind it. 
Investigations were started into Cuyahoga County Children and Family Services and the daycare centers Anaya attended. Cuyahoga County released a statement that read, We know that we are expected to see and recognize patterns of abuse and neglect, and if the internal investigation determines we did something wrong, there will be discipline. Following their investigation, they announced changes would be made and pledged to hire additional staff. There's more work to be done. Here with Cuyahoga County, with DCFS, with the Child Welfare Panel, there is more work to be done here in our community. Get Ready, Set, Grow Child Care Center was found to be understaffed and that children in their care had been left unattended in a locked room. The center also failed to keep records of attendance. In 2019, Anaya's birth father filed a lawsuit claiming that inaction by Cuyahoga County children and family services contributed to Anaya Day Garrett's murder. Cuyahoga County Council didn't contest this and unanimously approved a settlement of $3 million. Don't forget to like this video if you found it interesting and subscribe to join us in the next episode of True 911.